All right, Janine, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation about uh, every realm and everything that's going on at the organization right now, some of your thoughts about where things are going in this space. But first, I would love to hear a little bit about your background and what's brought you to every realm. Sure. So my name is Janine Yorio. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Every Realm. I began my career in finance on Wall Street, and then I worked in private equity where I covered the hospitality and casino gaming sector. And about eight years ago, I started working in real estate tech for a startup that was in the hospitality industry. And that's how I made the transition from where I was to where I am today. I then uh, started out on my own and built a real estate app, which I built and sold to a company that was big in the crypto space. And through that journey, actually found myself, uh, along with my former colleagues, dabbling in metaverse real estate, which in 2020 became a pretty big theme. And so what we started as an experiment actually turned into one of the key things that everybody who spoke to us wanted to talk about. And we had this kernel of an idea to build a company around this thesis. And lo and behold, here we are about 18 months later, and I'm running a company called Every Realm, which has expanded far beyond just acting as passive investors in metaverse real estate. Today, we uh, have a portfolio of over 40 um, venture capital style investments in the immersive media space. We have a portfolio of companies that we own a majority stake in that is over 10 companies. Um, and so we're actually building and expanding into this immersive media sector across lots of different disciplines. But, but the unifying factor is we build products for people that love virtual worlds. And there are a lot of those people on the planet today. Fantastic. So we will definitely get into some of the products or maybe platforms, depending on how you would like to frame those up with Hometopia and uh, The Row and some of these other things in a second. But I'd like to take a step back, and I love what you just described. I mean, the direction of where things are going. But one of the things that uh, I know near and dear to my heart, one of my nephews, is huge into Roblox and Minecraft and all these things. So when we start to think about Gen Z and virtual worlds, how much more likely are they to actually engage in that space? So there are two demographic groups that I think we need to treat a little bit differently. Gen Alpha, which I presume is is what, what your nephew falls into, yes. and Gen Z, which are people who are young adults today up to the age of 27. They were born after 1996. Kids today are spending massive amounts of time in virtual world. And that was a trend that was really catalyzed by the pandemic where that was their primary for form of socialization. So hundreds of millions of kids spend probably almost an unhealthy amount of time today in Roblox and Fortnite and Minecraft. And for them, that's a part of their life. That's how they socialize. For many of them, their online life is just as important as their life in the real world. But there's also a slightly older demographic and they've aged out of those platforms. Some of them may still play Fortnite or Minecraft occasionally, but they are avid gamers for whom video games are an integral part of their life. And they're also very comfortable in virtual worlds. They're the generation that grew up playing Club Penguin. They had Neopets and, and Webkins. And for them, video games aren't another thing. They are a core part of their identity and their childhood. And it's not like it was when we were children where your console was attached to your TV and it was this thing you did in discrete intervals. They're a generation that grew up with smartphones. And so they've been gaming on the sneak when they're supposed to be studying in school while they're commuting to work, while they're waiting for, for planes and in restaurants. It's such a part of their behavior that it's no longer stigmatic for them to spend lots and lots of time in video games and in virtual worlds. The same way that we saw online dating go from being something that a few people did or people did on the slide to something that now, if you're looking to connect romantically, you are inevitably on dating apps. And we're seeing the same thing happen in virtual worlds. Virtual worlds are not new. They've been around for a long time. Uh, Second Life has been around since 2003, and the concept of video game worlds has been around for decades. But what's changed is how mainstream their use and adoption has become. And we're seeing that play out in kids and then young adults today. So I, I love the way you've uh, expressed that because it makes a lot of sense to me. It resonates, but it also takes us to the next sort of concept that I'd love to hear your ideas on. And that is Web3. Is Web3 from your world more of a a branding thing, or is there some legs to this? Does this really make sense? I think that over the past two years, Web3 and Metaverse have become very conflated. 
And it's really more a function of timing than necessity. Web3 is an ethos that um, the internet ought to be owned by the people creating it and your data ought to be owned by you. And along with that ethos came crypto, which is all about decentralization and cooperative ownership. So these trends were colliding at the same time, but they're not necessarily all as intertwined as the, the public uh, writing about them would lead you to believe. I think it's actually more of a coincidence that a perfect storm happened and all these things are happening contemporaneously. Web3 is an important evolution in the internet. And I do think people are becoming more proprietary about their data. They do wanna see different platforms. There are certain very large platforms that have very negative perceptions by uh, younger users. There's also crypto, there's also virtual worlds. And I think there will be pieces of each of them that become integral to the other, but they're not necessarily all required in order for any one of them to take hold. So drilling in a little bit, to that, do you think that decentralization is something that's important to this? Like if we were to look at like Meta and what they're trying to build eventually in some point in time versus like Hometopia or Sandbox or Mona or Decentraland, all of those types of things, I would have thought you basically have these large organizations that have been around for ages, um, <laughs> ages, a few decades maybe. Um, and then you have these new startups or organizations that are building out these more decentralized versions, do you think that one will win out over the other? Or do you think that they're sort of just going to exist, coexist, so to speak? I think this intense focus on things like decentralization and infrastructure is a function of crypto volatility over the past few years. So we're talking about things that are infrastructure, whether, whether a product is decentralized or not, is not necessarily the reason why a user falls in love with the product. The same way a user doesn't fall in love with the product because uh, the pay rails are on Stripe or running on you know, some other alternate payment platform. We only talk about crypto as much as we do because it also offered an opportunity for people to speculate. You take that away and what is at the core of crypto is a blockchain ledger, which is a good way of storing and retaining information but it's not a reason why people fall in love with a product. They fell in love with the speculati speculation and a lot of products were built on top of crypto that don't require the speculative element, but which benefited from the enthusiasm about that speculation. What's important to understand is a blockchain is just another piece of a tech stack that can be used to create a superior product. And I do believe there will be many instances where Crypto and blockchain are used as payment rails and other modes of retaining and managing information and ownership, but they are not going to be the primary thing you see, for example, when you look at a website for a new virtual world. It's not what's going to make people fall in love with a product. And if you take away the speculative element, what's left is ostensibly a video game. And if that video game doesn't attract and retain users at scale, it's a flop. So how the developers choose to build it and the infrastructure and tech stack they select and whether it has blockchain or doesn't is one factor in whether that game achieves popular adoption, but it's not the core factor. And I think you're going to see an evolution in the very near term of crypto becoming something that we treat as it ought to be, which is as plumbing and infrastructure for a very big sector and an important component, but not the one that is in your face on a website. The same way you wouldn't expect a website to say, you know, this website runs on AWS or Google Cloud. The end user doesn't care. It's what the developers care about, but it's not what makes users fall in love with the product. So okay. you, listed, you listed several virtual worlds, and I just want to clarify, some of them are decentralized but many are not. And Hometopia, for example, which is one of our companies, is not being built in a decentralized fashion. It is being built by a core group of developers who retain control and ownership over that platform. And there are no immediate plans to integrate crypto into it anytime soon. Okay. No, thank you. And that's, that's a great entree into, uh, could you give us a little understanding about Hometopia first? And I'd love to hear about the row afterwards. Sure. So Hometopia is um, a design game for serious home builders. So there are people who love playing games like The Sims, which is one of the most popular games in the world and has been for a very long time. And also very young users who play a game called Bloxburg in Roblox, which is also a game where the core game loop is about home design. So there are tremendous tailwinds in the home builder sector. And the team behind Hometopia has built other successful home building games in the past, including a mobile game that had millions of downloads. 
Hometopia is built for the people that absolutely love the home building component of those games and want to build more photo real, more detailed versions of homes with their friends in this new environment where they can build together. It's a free to play game. It's on Steam now and uh, it will be available for download later this year. Ah, so, okay. I didn't realize that. I saw the video and I, I loved it because I've yeah. always been in that space and I think it's yeah, fantastic. There, there are nearly a hundred thousand people already on the wish list on Steam for Hometopia. So it's already having a groundswell of excitement. I think home building is very much a part of the popular imagination. And in fact, the creator of Hometopia, Alex Ayland, is also a restorer of period homes in real life. So he's not just a video game maker who makes home design games, but he's also a real life DIY guy who's fixed up a historic home with his wife and done so in a really loving and beautiful way. So it is a place for serious builders who really enjoy building, but maybe don't wanna to go to Home Depot on the weekend. <laughs> they wanna do it in a more, um, a more consolidated way that isn't so taxing on their, on their body. I totally or get their, that. Or their wallet. That's true. <laughs> no, all that stuff is so expensive these days. It's unbelievable. Um, so the row, is it somewhat similar, but obviously a little bit more artistic, more a little more design centric around sculptures and in the virtual worlds, or does it differ a lot? Totally different. Um, the row isn't interactive in the way that Hometopia is. Hometopia is a video game. So you or I could go on there and build a home together and move things around uh, and change it just like we would in any other builder style game with user generated content. The row is a project that we actually conceived of over a year ago. Uh, times were different. The market was a bit different. We had had some success with a, a metaverse real estate project called Fantasy Islands, which I actually designed on the back of a napkin. And I thought, well, what if we enlisted real artists, not me, to design the most fantastic vision of what a home could be like in a video game world, a place with no physics, with no cost of construction materials, where an artist's vision for what homes of the future could look like can really take on literally any form. And so we commissioned artists to design their vision of homes, which we uh, made limited editions of five from each artist. And they range from a house that looks somewhat like a regular house to something that actually looks like a, a capsule that's suspended in space. So very unique and futuristic views of home, but they're meant to be really collectibles and trophies for people that wanna have a very um, high profile, artistic and, and almost museum quality home that they can transport into different virtual worlds. So it doesn't require the user to do much of anything aside from buy it. Hometopia, you've got to build everything yourself. So there is a vein running through all of this, which is that people want to have a virtual life. And one of the things, you know, after you clothe your avatar in the virtual world, then you want to find a place that's your own, that you can settle into, that you can make yours. And that concept of homes in the virtual world permeates both of those projects. Fantastic. So to kind of bridge the previous conversation with this one, I'd love to hear, and if you can't, I totally respect that, your ideas around NFTs in this environment. Is that something that you all would ever go down the road of? It, they can be proprietary, um, centralized NFTs that people are then able to sell or trade, or whatever the case is. Is that a component that could be involved in either one of the Hometopia or the Row? We have no plans to integrate NFTs or crypto into Hopetopia anytime soon. That's not to say never. Who knows what the future has in store, but I, I don't think it's on the near-term roadmap. Okay. But the enough. Row is an NFT project. It is built on um, uh, an, an Ethereum-compatible blockchain, and it is ultimately an NFT project where the NFT connotes ownership of the and the provenance of the project itself or of the that particular asset in the project. I think NFTs are interesting. We have certainly spent a fair amount of time in that space. We've been NFT issuers. We also manage uh, a fund that invests in NFT assets or speculates in NFT assets. Um, we like video games that use in-game assets that are NFTs. So we are definitely very much in that ecosystem. And I think there are a lot of interesting things happening in the NFT world. What is more interesting is, is what's happening in video gaming, where this concept that you can buy a gun or a car in one game and port it to another and your ownership travels, and then you can sell it more easily in a secondary marketplace because it is on the blockchain. But we, we are 
interested in NFTs, we are a bit more cautious than we were a year ago. We are certainly watching the space very closely and, and believe that there is definitely a strong role for crypto and NFTs and blockchain in the future, especially in this virtual world and immersive media ecosystem. I, I debate this with people all the time about NFTs and the interoperability of them from one world to another. Personal opinion on that, I, I firmly believe that there there will be a place for that among many different virtual worlds. Everyone will not go that way. I, I clearly understand that, but I think the forces will push people possibly in that direction because if I buy, pretend, um, I don't know, a DeWalt um, hammer or... Uh, power drill in one world that's focused in on maybe building homes, I'd want to be able to port that over to another one because I've already paid for it, whatever the case is, or the Nike shoes or the, the Birkin bag, whatever the case is, right? You can port mm -hmm. that over to other ones. It'd be great to be able to do that. Um, ah, we'll see what happens in that space. I think that's the, the holy grail of this space is this concept of interoperability. What has to happen is a unified set of standards that a consortium of developers agree, you know, this is what 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 language these these projects are going to be built in. It's not just what chain they're going to be on, but do they look visually compatible? Are they of the same style as the assets in a game? If it's built in a in a in a way that's a boxy like Minecraft, doesn't make sense for that same asset to then be in your Fortnite or Valorant game. So there are other issues that aren't related to the blockchain side of things, which are equally important when it comes to gameplay and user experience, that there will have to be some sort of collaboration about in order for that to work. And I don't think we're quite there yet. I think there's a lot of talk about it. It was a hot topic a year ago for sure. And I think people are realizing the most important thing in video games and virtual worlds is making products that people love, making gaming experiences that are memorable, that allow people to do things they can't do easily in the real world and to do it in a way that makes them come back. And um, the speculative element of NFTs were actually harmful to that ethos. And that's why there's been pushback by the gaming community because speculation and genuinely fun game experiences are not the same thing. They both might drive intrigue, but from two different groups of people. And if one subset has bought up lots of assets, but then isn't using them in the game or adding to the gaming environment, you've actually created an empty experience for the people that are wanting to enjoy the game side of things. So there are these competing goals, and I think there will be some interesting resolutions as we find more products that work, more games that people love, more virtual worlds that combine some of these elements. And I think the future is really bright. No, I, I think that's very well said. So maybe transitioning into one other area that I'm kind of curious about from your vision is the hardware part. Uh, clearly a lot of this stuff is being done via a browser at this point in time, but are, are, you, are you preparing for what may happen with Apple? Hopefully the next six to 12 months, they should be releasing a headset. Is that something that you will go down the road of, or you kind of hold off on that for a while? I think that the intense focus on VR in this space has actually been one of its downfalls. Hmm. The penetration of ownership of VR headsets is minuscule compared to the percentage of the world's population that owns smartphones or gaming consoles or PCs or laptops. And I, I, I tie it all back to the movie Ready Player One, where there's this unforgettable visual of somebody strapped into their VR headset and, and re, uh, not participating in real life and spending all their time in the virtual world. And that has created this self-perpetuating narrative that this space is inextricably linked to VR headsets. And I think that's not exactly where the market is headed. I've been in tech for a while now, but I've been human for longer. And I've been hearing that VR is the next big thing for a very long time. And I'm still very skeptical. I strongly believe that humans prefer to interact with technology about a foot and a half from their face, not here, but here. It's very distracting to have something strapped to your face. It makes you very vulnerable and prone to injury. It's also hard to fake it. You can't do it while you're at work or at school, which is oftentimes, or, or while you're doing something else like walking. And you can't do that if you have a opaque video game screen strapped to your face. Then people will say, well, okay, it's not VR, then it's AR. Maybe it's AR, but an awful lot of very well-funded companies have tried to make something beyond Pokemon that resonates and nobody's really succeeded at that either. What has been time-tested that, that people love are playing video games on 
smaller screens and slightly larger screens that are about a foot and a half or more from their face. And so I think that that's where we're going to see adoption. It will be browser-based, PC-based, console-based, and to a certain extent, mobile-based if we can get beyond um, the new rules that Apple has imposed on the mobile gaming space, which have actually caused a lot of the creativity in that space to shift over to, um, to more traditional laptops and desktops and console games. But I, I do not believe that VR is going to be the major disruptor that the media would have you believe it is going to be. Yeah, I think I think you're right about that. I think it's, there's certainly a place for it, but uh, my firm belief is that uh, some mixed reality or AR is probably what's next that will probably trigger a lot of different things because then you'll be able to interact with people, see things in your environment, but also do the things that you want to do um, associated with whatever that you're you're doing. If it's a fully immersive thing, yes, VR could make sense or clearly browsers, but. Um, yeah, and I guess we'll have to see. It's a number of years, well, in the next year and then beyond, uh, what will happen with that. The last question before I'd love to open it up to you, see if there's anything you'd like to mention beyond what this question is, is play to earn. Do you, do you believe in that concept? I know it doesn't necessarily fall into this space with Hometopia per se, but in the broader scheme of things, is that something that you think is of value long-term within this gamified world that we're moving into? I think play to earn over the past year and a half, two years has shown us that it's an interesting path to distribution. If you can figure out how to effectively compensate people for playing your game, they will choose your game over other games. And that will allow you to bypass things like traditional game publishers or the app store. Uh, what what is not sustainable are some of the economics and the, the economies that were designed around play to earn because ultimately somebody's got to pay for the earning and in an environment where the token that's being used as payment isn't constantly increasing in value that becomes unsustainable. I'm um, cautiously optimistic. I think humans are always ingenious and whenever you say never, lo and behold, somebody figures it out. So I think there's an opportunity there for somebody to create a real in-game economy that is sustainable in a way that supports some sort of user compensation. But I don't think what we've seen thus far is terribly compelling or, or something that's likely to lead to a long-term evolution in the gaming environment that becomes massively um, utilized across the sector. Makes sense. And I, and I appreciate that perspective, no question. All right, Janine, anything else you'd like to mention? I think it's I think it's just a very interesting time for the space. The past year was all about metaverse and now it's all about no metaverse. You know, with last week the Financial Times published an article about uh, the interest in metaverse withering and there's a phenomenon that people are calling the metaverse fade. And I think a lot of that is largely attributable to Facebook changing its name and then Facebook's market cap taking a nosedive subsequently, but the behavioral shift and the consumer trends toward people spending time in virtual worlds is incontrovertible. It's absolutely happening. People are doing it. I think Mark Zuckerberg's vision is a little bit different than what people actually want. People want a safe space to make bad decisions, right? They want vice. They want, they want to, unfortunately, to destroy things and to do things that are harder to do in real life or often carry a lot of consequences. And, and Mark's vision was really about replacing the workplace and making things that were probably a little bit too aw shucks for what people really want. But I do strongly believe that the next social media network is a video game. And when you're looking about how to reinvent media, which, which people are very much trying to figure out because traditional media models, network television, print, radio, the demographics of people that are spending time there are quite old. Young audiences are spending time in virtual worlds. So every traditional media player on the planet now is sitting there thinking, how do I get into immersive media? And, and the truth is, it is in video gaming. It's a virtual world, social video games. And those players have to embrace the fact that oftentimes that comes with content that isn't G-rated. Hmm. And make peace with that, which is an uncomfortable reality, but it's very much the truth. Even in Minecraft, which isn't violent, is still about destruction. You know, there's a constructive element, but... There's swords and, you know, it's, it's, it is, 
it's what people like to do in video games. <laughs> and that is what I strongly believe will drive adoption. And that's very uncomfortable for a lot of, a lot of media players, a lot of brands that are trying to figure out how to play the space. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how it unfolds, but I think it's going to be a lot like when HBO made every network rethink their policy on being so puritanical in their standards. You know, when HBO suddenly started using profanity and nudity, it wasn't just viewed as this is an outlier event, but this is a true behavioral shift. And the networks that refused to evolve, the ones that didn't start thinking about how they get into that more mature audience mindset actually failed. So it's going to take a little bit of a sea change for things to really catch up with where audiences are today, which is in virtual worlds, social video games, and short form video like TikTok and YouTube. No, I, I totally agree with you. I think um, the part that's kind of funny, like this, yes, the, the violence sometimes still is there, uh, or or in Dookie Dash from uh, Board Ape Yacht Club, where you're in a sewer and you're <laughs> collecting things in a sewer. Uh, the, Gross, uh, right? It's scat humor, but that sells, you know, people like it. It does. It does. All right. My goodness. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I think this is a fantastic conversation and I really thank you for your time. Thank you, Joe. All right. Take care.